Welcome everybody to today's program. This is the introduction to the Civil War. My name is Lauren Oback and I'm your moderator for the program today. I'm a librarian here at the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. We're recording the session today and it'll be available on our YouTube channel within a couple days. Today's presentation is brought to you by the Friends of the Library and the Monroe Historical Society, both of which are actively looking for new members and for volunteers and board members. The Historical Society is also hosting its annual Christmas Fair on December 3rd, 4th, and 5th at their meeting house on Barnhill Road. And for more information on that, you can visit their Facebook page. We do encourage questions and conversation throughout the program. What we're gonna ask you to do is put those questions into the chat box. We'll stop periodically and Arthur will answer questions and he'll also have time at the end to get to any of those questions. You can also use the raise hand feature, which I can see right away. If you would like to ask a question using your microphone, you just need to get somebody's attention first um, so that we can actually hear you. There's a delay between when you start speaking and when we can hear you. I just also turned on AI assisted closed captioning, which you can turn off by clicking the C button at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on your device. <laughs> This is going to run for seven sessions, and the last session is going to be on January 26th. If you're here today, you're registered for the entire program. Now I'm going to introduce Arthur Gottlieb, a local historian on subjects of political and military history. He was a professional curator of naval history and a technical director of exhibits at the Intrepid. He has worked extensively with veterans, and he himself was an auxiliary officer of the United States Coast Guard for 17 years. He is now a certified senior advisor, where he offers pro bono counseling to those returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me. I uh, wonder how many in my audience today have been to some of our previous programs. Uh, if you have, then you'll know my style of discussing things. And uh, we're going to have plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, as they come up, please just put them in the chat room or uh, just raise your hand as was said before. So the Civil War, the American Civil War, is something that can't be talked about enough, in my opinion. And like many other things, it, it's kind of gotten drowned out by other um, elements in the news and the fact that it was, you know, relatively speaking, a long time ago. So uh, for some people, uh, for some people who might think that it's all or, or already over the horizon, uh, if I was to speak to somebody who was, say, I don't know, under 30 years old, I would say well, what is the significance of the American Civil War? I wonder what the answer would be. Um, for me, it, it's a little bit closer than that because uh, the people who raised me, the age group of, of my parents' age, uh, generation, were greatly influenced by events of the Civil War. Uh, those who fought in World War II, all of the generals, the officers, et cetera, vastly studied the American Civil War. Um, today, it has the um, patina of being mm, discussed in a different light because of political events having to do with um, uh, racial issues in our country today, whether or not we should have statues of a Robert E. Lee, uh, whether or not there should be any kind of celebration or at least commemoration or study of uh, anybody who happened to be on the Confederate side. Um, I'm gonna try and put a lot of this in context today and uh, in our following sessions. Um, my goal is to go for understanding with these things. Uh, I could do two different programs on the Civil War, one just on military history, one just on the the, the history of how it has affected the people who were involved at the time and the legacy that it has on uh, world and American politics. Um, and there would be two different presentations. Uh, I'm going to combine them a little bit. Uh, the syllabus that I sent out, I'm 
I'm sure that you have. Uh, you'll notice that I broke this down into seven parts uh, where I thought they were the most significant. Um, number one today, introduction, where I'm gonna give you an overview of everything we're gonna be talking about and why. Uh, the second session next week, Abraham Lincoln and the election of 1860. Uh, session three, the industrialized North versus the agrarian South. Uh, session four, blacks and the civil war. Session five, the war fought on rivers and seas. Session six, from Atlanta to Appomattox. And then very importantly, session seven, which I normally just have of, you know, conclusions and future implications, um, is going to be on reconstruction, which is something that is absolutely critical um, about the aftermath of the Civil War and how we tried to put this country back together after the Civil War. Uh, absolutely critical. We cannot understand where we are today without understanding every single one of the content of these lectures. And I hope I do it justice and thank you for joining me. So the Abraham Lincoln and the election of 1860 Right, we are going to look at what kind of country this was in um, the period between the American Revolution, uh, the War of 1812, and what was to become, of course, the American Civil War. It's really not that much of a span if you consider that the American Civil War, the rumblings for it, started already by the 1820s. We already had what was going to be a direct line straight to the Civil War. And uh, so that didn't take very long uh, from, the, uh, from the adoption of our constitution in the 1780s uh, to the 1820s, where we already had tension that was gonna lead to the Civil War. That didn't take very long. And there's oftentimes considered the American Civil War to be really the American Revolution part two. Uh, it was the trying to settle unfinished business that was left unsettled from the American Revolution. For those of you who haven't seen any of my programs on the American Revolutionary War, um, I'll just follow up with, by saying that um, the founding documents of the United States left the issue of slavery um, unresolved to say the least. And it was a matter of getting a half a loaf instead of no loaf, that the even the Declaration of Independence was written the way it was. Because the independence, the Declaration of Independence was written with a clause in it, denouncing the institution of slavery, the original Declaration of Independence by Jefferson. And that was edited out of the original Declaration of Independence, understanding that it was, uh, Jefferson understood that the notion that all men are created equal is inherently incompatible with the notion of chattel slavery, institutionalized slavery as a business in this nation. Um, but that was edited out. And the reason it was edited out was because the Southern states would not sign on to the Declaration of Independence with that clause in it. So that meant that the idea was, going back to my half a loaf uh, analogy, that we are not going to have independence from Great Britain unless we make this compromise now by taking out Jefferson's clause about eradicating slavery. And then we're just gonna kind of kick the can down the road here and get our country first which I remind you that in 1775 was considered quite the long shot, all right? The chances are uh, there was no way that the North American British colonies were gonna successfully break away from Great Britain anyway, let alone win a war against the largest naval and military power on earth, but we did. And uh, so then having been the uh, proverbial dog that caught the bus, so to speak, uh, we had to self-govern 
and the unresolved issues of the fact that essentially half our country felt as though we should be able to hold slaves if we wanted to. And the other half of the country was saying, well, no, that's immoral. All right. And that, of course, became even more pronounced as our country in the early 1800s was expanding west. Right. So we went from our original 13 colonies and now our country is moving west. Um, out past the Appalachian Mountains, et cetera, into the Ohio Valley uh, and points further. And it was an aspiration for places that started off as uh, territories to eventually achieve statehood in the Union. In other words, the United States of America. So this put a lot of pressure on on the system of allowing the Southern states to have slaves, this expansion West, because as new states were added to the union, the question was, are they going to be slave states or, or are they going to be free states? And the, just to give you a quick refresher, the 10th amendment of the constitution of the United States says that whatever is not in the constitution giving the federal government authority to be in charge of automatically defers to the judgment and the auspices of the powers within the respective state in question, you see? So in other words, slavery isn't mentioned in the constitution. So therefore, I mean, on paper at least, um, technically speaking, slavery is really none of the federal, federal government's business. You see, so if a state wanted to be a slaveholding state, it could be a slaveholding state, and it wasn't in the Constitution. See, but by the early 1800s, this was already becoming uh, a bit of an issue because new states that new territories wanting to achieve admission into the Union would have to apply for that status of becoming a state. And they would do generally what was they needed to do to become beholden to be a state. And the federal government was of the opinion by the early 1800s uh, that slavery was something that we should be on the way to abolishing. You see? So the federal government now had an influence here. It had picked a side, you might say. And there are things we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna be talking about the Missouri Compromise. We're gonna be talking about other various things uh, that came up to solve this tension about whether or not the federal government really had a role in deciding what an individual state was gonna do or not gonna do. That as far as the constitution was concerned, wasn't the federal government's business. And you, you know that to a certain degree, at least, we have some of the same arguments going on today um, with other various things. 10th Amendment to the Constitution. So as the states going west were gaining admission, were they gonna be slave states or not? Now, the South felt the traditional slaveholding states in the South, deep South, uh, which was agrarian in nature, and cotton was its primary crop, uh, relying very largely on, on this institution of slavery to make the whole thing run. The Southern states noticed that you couldn't just take a, well, why does it mean anything to us, whether a state, whether the federal government is, you know, having states going west, be non-slave holding states, right? It was, it was of interest to the Southern states to make sure that this issue of the 10th Amendment applied wholeheartedly to all of those states going West and that they, if they wanted to be a slave holding state that they should be allowed to do so. Because the Southern states realized that as our country was getting larger and larger and with manifest destiny, it was inevitable that we would reach, achieve the, uh, the entire landmass to the Pacific coast, then who knows how many states there would be. And, but clearly 
there was going to be more states collectively than there were going to just be a handful of states that were going to remain, what, the only slaveholding states left in the Union. So the southern states didn't want to be left in a situation where they were going to be completely surrounded by a majority of non-slaveholding states. So they wanted to modify this from the get-go to make sure that there were plenty of slaveholding states, you see, so they wouldn't be left alone and then forced to give up their uh, entire livelihoods and way of life of being slaveholding states. So this became like this massive argument. 1820, 1830, 1840, it was already on fire, this whole thing. And um, inevitably it led to armed conflict. And that leads up to the election of Abraham Lincoln and the election of 1860, you see, um, directly up to 1860. As a matter of fact, 1860, Abraham Lincoln being elected, uh, according to the Southern states that were the first to secede from the Union, South Carolina, I mean, that was really the trigger point. The election of 1860 was, was a shot across the bow to any slaveholding state that the Union was not going to tolerate slavery moving forward. And that is really the election of 1860 was the, the seminal point that the South felt like they needed to, if they were gonna make a move, they needed to make a move now. And um, that the election of 1860 was really a hostile action because in the South's point of view, Abraham Lincoln had already expressed that he was going, that any secession uh, was illegal and that he was going to fight to maintain the union. And, um, well, the South felt that that was actually unconstitutional, right? The South felt like it had an, a right to secede from the United States of America. And Abraham Lincoln was clear on his position that that was illegal and he was gonna stop any state from seceding from the United States of America. And that eventually, of course, was going to lead to armed conflict. So on Wednesday, December 1st, we will have the industrialized North versus the agrarian South. And we'll talk about how by the nature of things, uh, the Northern states of the United States were wound up being, having, you know, the industrial, industrialized North. They were uh, had the foundries, the foundries being the places where you can uh, create steel and iron and all the rest of these things. It was a little too early for steel, but I'm talking about cast iron, wrought iron, uh, the, the manufacturing of machinery, steam engines, um, railroad uh, cars and locomotives, railroad tracks, uh, various kinds of machinery for the manufacturer of all of the things I'm talking about. Remember, it's one thing to actually make metal from molten metal. It's another thing to take that casting and then machine it into what actually can do useful work in the form of a locomotive or uh, some other kind of machine that's going to be used to make other parts. Uh, this is very critical. You don't have an industrialized world without these things. And uh, the North was the place where that was being done. Uh, the United States uh, in the North at this period of time was responsible for what we'll call the second industrial revolution of the world. Uh, the first industrial revolution was held by Great Britain in um, the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. And, um, you know, with textiles and all the rest of that thing and weaving machines, um, the United States of America in the position of uh, being having this vast continent with all of our resources, where we were building ships and we had all kinds of materials, raw materials. And so we were the natural place for the second industrial revolution. And we had the place to do it because Great Britain was a very small place compared compared to the entire landmass of the, what was to be the continental United States. So if you wanted to build railroad bridges, 
for instance. I mean, this is really the place to come and do it because it was just wide open uh, as far as early railroads were concerned, the telegraph, uh, all sorts of in inventions. People came from Europe all the time who were engineers and they wanted to make their mark because this was the place to do it. And we had a lot of the talent, a lot of the raw materials, a lot of the financial incentive, and we had an entire continent we were looking forward to conquering. And uh, so this was the place it was gonna happen. So the South was really a different society. Um, I wonder how many of you have seen the movie, probably all of you like I have seen uh, things like Gone with the Wind, right? And so Gone with the Wind, of course, you have the cynical Rhett Butler, who even though he's a person who's there in, in the South, he's a bit of an outcast because he feels like the, the men of the South and the women of the South were a little bit too cavalier in their notion that we're gonna have this romantic war to separate ourselves from the Yankees. And it's all gonna be very grand and we're gonna be home by Christmas and nobody wants to miss out on it, you know, because it's just gonna be the event of a lifetime, okay? And it's all gonna be for God and for country and it's going to be uh, for our honor and our lifestyle and everything else like that. Very, a lot of, you know, 19th century values involved in things like this. We have to remember that. We can't see it as a, uh, with, with the, uh, the mistake of something we call presentism. Historians call things presentism when we look at things that happened hundred year, hundreds of years ago from the lens of how a person or how society would see it today. We must go back to the time and see it for what it was by the people who were seeing it for what it was at that time. And uh, the, I think that the movie Gone with the Wind did a good job of that because it shows the, as I said, the use of word, the cavalier nature of how grand this is gonna be. And we're gonna give those, those Yankees a licking and we're going to protect the honor of our women and our uh, property, including slaves and our way of life, right? And, you know, Rhett Butler was like, you know, maybe you guys should think about this a couple of times more before you just rush into it, because it's not gonna be that simple, um, which of course made him an outcast. And I won't spoil the rest of the movie for you, although I'll probably go back to it here and there. And so the South was, more like Europe in a sense. It was more like Great Britain as far as you had the aristocracy and uh, the people who were the landowners in the South were, the, were aspirational to this type of lifestyle where you had, the, you had the privileged upper class and then you had the working class, right? In this case, slaves. Um, but to understand this properly, one must understand how slave owners actually perceived their slaves. Uh, they, they saw it themselves in psychology, we call this a rationalization, but it was, they saw them more as indentured servants. Uh, and maybe that was just to soften what they were doing to themselves because everybody of course considered themselves Christians. And if you're a Christian, how can you really enslave another, another human being that is made from the same creator as you say so you need what we call rationalizations uh things that make it okay oh well slavery is in the bible or they're not really christians because uh black people can't be christians right and the reason why somebody thought that black people can't be christians is to solve the dilemma i was just telling you about so if they're not christians then you're not doing anything wrong okay so um, I think that we all understand these points, but it's still important to, to go back and see things for what they were. And also in the haughtiness of thinking that you were part of a superior culture, that is white Christian culture in this case, and sophisticated culture, you're looking at uh, things not only from a standpoint of race, but it overlaps into class that you think that you're doing the right thing for people who are lesser than you, 
who couldn't possibly do for themselves, right? Which is something we call racism and uh, soft racism. It's the, the, the thought that you have to create an environment where all of these people can live because they're not capable of achieving anything on their own, all right? And there's a lot of that uh, in the past, uh, and there's a lot of that in the present, uh, in class structures, gender structures, and of course, racial structures, you see? So the people in the South felt as though they were doing the noble thing by taking in the lesser black person and making them work, of course, uh, and they didn't have any choice of their own, of course, slaves. You couldn't have, you, it wasn't your free choice, but somehow the people had this idea that you were being benevolent to these lesser peoples, and therefore it was your Christian duty to provide for them and make a living for them on their own behalf, because they couldn't possibly do it for themselves, you see? Very important to understand these things. And of course, there are just these other people who are just flat out sadists and uh, didn't really give a hoot about uh, any kind of Christian morality. And they were just like, you're my property. And you know, when you fall over because I've overworked you and dehydrated you, then I'll just get another slave to fill your position. See what I mean? And I'm not going to cut into my profit by feeding you more or something like that. Although it was in the benefit of slave owners to create a lifestyle where more procreation occurred, because then the products of that procreation became your property too, you see? Now for people in the North, generally speaking, particularly New England, uh, it was different. Uh, people always, since the founding of this nation, and even before, saw themselves as mm, more moralistic, perhaps, um, or as leaders of the way society ought to run in a more um, idealized way, perhaps the way God would have wanted it. Um, and so from New England and areas around New England, um, there was a different point of view. And there was slavery in the North, but it wasn't the kind of chattel slavery institutionalized that you saw in the South. And the North cannot be exonerated in any way, shape or form because many people in the North found it very, very lucrative when there was the, uh, what we'll call the Underground Railroad of uh, slaves uh, being, uh, escaping from their circumstances in the South, usually on the way to places like Canada, okay? And that if you were a Northerner and maybe you wanted to make some money by capturing these slaves who were making their way to Canada and then returning them back to their owner, and then you would essentially receive the bounty prize for that. You see, so there was plenty of money to be made in all of this and a lot of hypocrisy, clearly. Session four, Blacks and the Civil War, speaking of Blacks, all right? Um, I'll just use the term most likely Blacks instead of Negro or African-Americans or something like that. And um, well, what did black people, what was it like for a black person in the South? What was it like for a black person in the North? How did the Civil War change blacks perception about the United States of America? How did blacks perceive the Civil War? What was it? Um, how did it affect them? Right? As you know, many people fought who were black for the Northern cause. How did that happen? Did that, was that an original goal or did that happen as a result of events during the Civil War? So it turns out that's more true than the first part of my speculation. Um, 
where you have things like the Emancipation Proclamation, et cetera. The whole nature of the Civil War evolved over the four years that it was fought. And it became a war of anti-slaverism, sla uh, slavery, uh, for most, that is. And it didn't necessarily start out that way. It started off more as a cause to save the Union, right? Now, if you were a person who was fighting the Civil War to save the Union, and really the the paradigm shifted towards, well, really, this is a moral cause to slave, to, to emancipate slaves. You might not necessarily be on board with what it morphed into. You were like, well, wait a minute, I'm here to save the United States, and I don't have a problem with slaves being slaves, especially if they're black slaves, you see? So there were plenty of people who didn't really want to be on board with this notion of shifting from, well, yes, we want to maintain the union, and now you're telling me that I'm fighting to free slaves, to free black people so they can be my equals. I don't agree with that. So there was plenty of that. And even Abraham Lincoln himself had evolved from his position. I mean, he didn't necessarily want to, at, at, I mean, even in 1860, he did, he was, his goal wasn't to free black slaves. His goal was to limit the increase of slave holding states. And I explained to you, at least in, in a brief manner, how that triggered the South. And then later on, it became a moral crusade to emancipate black people. So uh, in historical readings, I mean, Lincoln is oftentimes referred to as the youngest founding father. So he is like, from the standpoint of what Lincoln, because of circumstances and time, put him in that place in time and who Lincoln was in the Civil War, he became really the person who was going to try to make uh, Jefferson's original ideas, right? Make it the, part two of what was tried to be achieved in the original Declaration of Independence, which really couldn't really be uh, see fruition because of the circumstances of the day, as I told you, that the Southern states just wouldn't sign on to it. You know, everybody thought, really, even Southerners thought that, you know, this issue of slavery was something that probably was unsustainable. Okay, by the way that technology was moving forward and um, there was, it was probably not gonna be the case that black people in this nation were gonna be able to be kept illiterate forever. And that was gonna create problems because once a person becomes literate, then they can read and that's gonna help them think for themselves and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so really everybody kind of thought, certainly the founding fathers thought that, well, this thing, maybe it's just going to work itself out and write itself out, even back in the late 1700s, because everybody can see that this notion of chattel slavery in the modern world, as fast as that was moving, is, once again, to use the word, unsustainable. And... Um, as I talked about in my class with the Revolutionary War, um, being 2021 as it is, uh, we must put things in context to current readings and theories about what the original notion of the United States was and how, of course, that overlaps into what our discussion of the Civil War is. I'll give you case in point, the 1619 Project, which postulates that the only reason why the United States was um, sought to be created and break away from Great Britain was, was solely for the purpose of creating a country where slavery could be free to be institutionalized and spread throughout every level of society. Um, you know, so these arguments, of course, are still with us today. Uh, if we do a program on the 1619 project, then I could go into more detail about 
what parts of it people um, uh, think are factual and what parts of it are proved not to be fact, uh, factual, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, uh, if you watched even the, um, the uh, electoral races last night, uh, then you can see how these issues are still somewhat still on the table. And it's a direct line from what we're talking about in 1860 right to this moment. Unfinished business, really. So session five on December 29th. Uh, from Atlanta to Appomattox, which is, um, that's the part where I'm going to focus more on military forces, etc. We really had in the Civil War, there was the Western theater and the Eastern theater, right? And the Eastern theater is the one that's more well known uh, because, well, being most of the states were on the Atlantic coast, of course. And that's where most educated people were and the colleges were and, and, and the communication networks were and the established uh, societies, et cetera, right? So the Army of the Northern, uh, uh, the Army of the Potomac was the army that was um, fighting on behalf of keeping the Union together by the Northern forces. And then you have what was to become the Army of Northern Virginia. Okay, which was very, very famous, uh, headed by Robert E. Lee. Now you can see in the bibliography I sent you that, you know, Lee is a very revered figure. And um, there's a reason for this in the biographies and the recollections about Lee that exceeds that of any general from the North, even Grant. The fortune of the South politically what was going to happen to the South, the Confederate States of America was completely tied up with whether or not Lee was winning or not. Okay. Um, the South never had, and they knew they didn't have, the longevity uh, to create this war or to fight this war. They didn't see themselves as having created it. Uh, they saw the North, of course, as the provocateurs, <clears throat> and they were just defending themselves and their constitutional rights, by the way. But the South did knew, I mean, thinking people knew that they were not going to be able to last as long as the North, that the North had more manpower, it had more resources uh, from the standpoint, at least, of industrialization, and it had the machines, the North had the machines. And it also had the transportation system in the North, you see. So for the South, the war relied upon uh, whatever skills that their generals could bring from the standpoint of winning battles, right? And that, of course, was personified in, in General Lee. So when Lee was winning, 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 then you know people would be writing letters back to their loved ones in the south, and this, and it would be like, yes, we're kicking the butts of the Yankees, and that greatly increased morale, of course, and it made it seem as though you know we really have a shot at this, we the South, um, because it was pretty soon. It didn't take six months or a year to figure out that this was going to be a massive bloodbath. And this whole glorious notion of we're going to be back laughing about this and drinking uh, at Christmas time and saying, boy, wasn't that glorious. Um, that wasn't what war was. Certainly not this. I mean, the Civil War is really, you know, for its day, a highly mechanized war. And um, we didn't have internal combustion engines. We didn't have tanks. But we did have some things that were considered modern, all right? Um, and there were some very, very people, smart people fighting the Civil War. And you had smart people fighting other smart people. Uh, if you consider the Mexican-American War, which preceded the Civil War, it actually, I mean, for instance, from that standpoint, you had General Grant and, uh, not General Grant, but then a, 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 an officer from West Point, Grant, 
and an officer from West Point Lee fighting, of course, for the United States of America in the Mexican War. And uh, <clears throat> you have some very bright people from both sides uh, that started off at West Point and then actually, like Lee, had to choose when it was time to choose whether Lee was going to be loyal to the United States of America or to the cause of the South and his beloved state of Virginia. And so, you know, this is something we usually don't think of today in these regards. I mean, we have, you know, a certain level of nationalism, um, you know, go USA, or you've got an American flag, uh, maybe on a pole somewhere or a sticker on your car, I don't know. Um, of course, our soldiers are fighting for the United States. They're not fighting for a specific state, you see. Um, but back in those days, close to the end of the Revolutionary War and the Constitution that was created as a form of government, governance, the states were a big deal. The states were the sovereign entities that um, created the federal government, excuse me. So the states really were back in those days close to considering themselves as really like their own little countries. And they had gone together with the constitution to form a federal government to be the Greece that made all of the states be able to operate together, have a collective defense, have a, um, a method of uh, sending letters back and forth, having a, the post office that is, having a common currency. Other than that, the states considered themselves to be sovereign governments, you see? So if you and I lived back in that time, we may very well be considering uh, whether or not we were gonna be loyal to this far off centralized government um, that was telling us to do something that we did not want to do, nor is it the federal government's business to be telling us to do it. We might very well say, no, no, I'm a Connecticut person and as a Connecticut person, uh, we are sovereign and I'm going to fight for Connecticut. See? Now today, and certainly during the 20th century and certainly today, the, our, our country's relationship from the federal government to the individual states bear little resemblance to what I just described. You see, in the era of the uh, early 20th century, all of this changed and really the states became more and more and more just like these, um, um, these units of the federal government, right, which we are today. And, and states really have little sovereignty in the way that the people who were originally envisioned our government actually sought uh, or thought it would ever occur that, for instance, I mean, you know, in the state of Connecticut, if we have our sovereignty and we can choose to do something, but if we choose to do something that's against the policy of the federal government, then the federal government can withhold all kinds of money and all kinds of funds. You see, so, you know, the federal government has tremendous power through regulation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to coerce individual states to do the federal government's bidding. This is something that was, you know, inconceivable back in the day. And so if back in the time that Lee had chosen the state of Virginia, where his heart belonged, that was much more of a plausible ration, uh, a de decision for somebody like him to make than it would be for us to understand today. Um, from Atlanta to Appomattox, what I'm getting at here is the conclusion of the Civil War, 
was driven in the last year of the war because we had a, we the North had a need to wrap it up. You see, there was an election coming for Abraham Lincoln. And I want you to see the parallels of how these things happened all the way back then to really political considerations that are made right to this day, certainly in our country. And that is that the South being a, the underdog, that's a good way to put it. The South being the underdog had to develop a strategy of winning the war where it couldn't continue winning military battles. So it had to have a, a socio-political way to lever the North in giving up. Now, what am I talking about here? What am I talking about? Well, recently we completed a program on Vietnam, right? Now, the North Vietnamese, even though they were funded and supplied, et cetera, by uh, the Soviet Union and uh, Maoist China, et cetera, Okay, um, they knew that to defeat a nation with essentially unlimited resources by comparison, the United States, that it couldn't really win uh, military battle after military battles. And then we would give up because we were military defe militarily defeated because we were never gonna be militarily defeated if we chose to remain in the fight. So the, the North used this same strategy as I'm saying that the South used in the Civil War. And it's simply this, that you have to make winning the war politically so expensive that the other side gives up. You see, it's unsustainable from a political standpoint. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, you know, I'm assuming that the people in my audience are at least as old as I am. Uh, and, you know, you will remember the 1960s, you will remember the early 1970s, and the sentiment here domestically, and how it changed political fortunes, uh, not the least of which, of course, was Lyndon Baines Johnson. You see, so once the pressure is put on a country that the war that you're in is so expensive, and uh, the people have, wa have lost the will to be prosecuting this fight, then it spells doom for politicians politically. And then politicians will be forced to change their platform uh, to appease the electorate. And then boom, war over, you see? And then the other side wins by default. And that's what the South was trying to do. The South was, making this so expensive for the North to win, then sentiment in the North, in New England, in New York and other places in the North, that the people in the North were saying, I don't know, I thought you said this was gonna be over in two years and here we are in four years. And I know four people who have um, been killed and it doesn't seem like we're any closer to victory, frankly. You see now Abraham Lincoln is coming up for re-election in the last, uh, within the last year of the war. And if he doesn't find a way to mop this up or show the American public in the North that this is winnable and we are winning, then his political fortunes are gonna be out the window. Somebody else will become president who said, I'm gonna get us out of this. And then by default, the South wins. So a different strategy is, is, is sought after by Northern forces between 1864 and 1865 to create some decisive things to happen. And that becomes the bringing forward to the Eastern frontier from the West, right? You had, first you had Grant who came, was from the West 
and uh, who was a more effective general than those previous in McClellan, okay? And then you had, of course, Grant picking another general from the West, which was William Tecumseh Sherman, you see? And William Tecumseh Sherman creates this campaign in the South from Atlanta, and it's the famous march to the sea, but first it was from the Tennessee territory into Atlanta. And getting back to Gone with the Wind, you had the Southerners uh, witnessing the burning of their city, deliberate burning of their city, you see, and what this was to mean for not only that particular war, but wars going forward as far as the strategy of winning wars, which is referred to as total war, right? Now, where total war, we usually mean that, well, whatever civilians get in the way, we can't really help that in collateral damage. Sherman was really trying to spare civilians, and he wanted to destroy the infrastructure of the South in the deep South because he felt that it would have a psychological impact on those in the deep South, where it seemed that if a Union army could run a 60 mile wide swath straight through Georgia and then to the coast in the Carolinas, and then make a 90 degree turn and move north, then the war really was unwinnable for the South because the Confederate army obviously was powerless to prevent this from happening. And not only that, but Sherman wanted to destroy as much infrastructure in the South as possible to make it impossible for the Southern army to have food, to have transportation, to have clothing. It was kind of like a psychological warfare. Uh, it was definitely a psychological warfare, despite the actual, uh, the actual tangible destruction. You see, so Sherman took it and flipped the psychological warfare that the South was trying to do to the North, and he flipped it back on the South and saying that, we are just gonna destroy everything in a 50 watt swath, swath straight to the Atlantic Ocean and there's nothing you can do about it. You cannot win. And it worked, ladies and gentlemen. It had a tremendous effect on the South and it led to the cessation of hostilities uh, where Sherman had turned North and was obviously going to hook up with uh, General Grant in areas around Appomattox. Lee, seeing that he was defeated, surrendered. And such was the prestige of Lee. And so connected were the, so connected were the fortunes of Lee and his army to the, the cause of the uh, Confederate States of America. As soon as Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse to Grant, the war was considered over. You know, of course, there were a faction of people who were like any such thing, were like, well, Lee didn't really surrender. He was just making it seem like he was going to surrender. And he's really going to come back and he's going to lead this huge resistance. And we're going to be, we're going to all go up to the mountains and we're going to carry this on forever until you know, until we eventually, and if I don't get you, my kids are gonna get you, you know, this sort of a thing, you know. Uh, it's a tremendous period of um, humiliation for the Southerners with this. Remember that in the 19th century, this was an era of chivalry and it was an era of honor and people did the right thing for the standpoint of this, you know, these notions of what was honorable and you would gladly go to your death, well, maybe not gladly go to your death, but you'd go to your death to prove that, to prove something, to stand up for something on behalf of something. And um, for the South, this was a devastating, 
moral and and um, you know obviously economic blow, but it was a tremendous blow psychologically and sociologically. And as far as reconstruction is concerned, I know I skipped over the war on seas and rivers. I'm gonna see if I have any time at the end to, to plug that in, okay? Because I think that this stuff that I'm telling you right now is more on point of where I wanna go with you. Reconstruction is not considered, I think, to the degree that it ought to be considered in its, in, in, in what it was we were trying to do in reconstruction and who was involved in those who were involved in reconstruction. Um, this was a uh, unique problem uh, in the Civil War as far as war was concerned because it, it wasn't one nationality fighting another nationality. It was literally Americans fighting Americans. And there were many in the North who felt like there should be punitive action against the states of the Confederate States of America to teach them a lesson and all the rest of this. Um, you know, we've seen lessons like this before. Um, we've seen lessons like this before. Unfortunately, uh, I think one of the most profound examples of the situation that we were in during Reconstruction gone wrong would be seen at the end of the European First World War, all right, and the time is 1919 and at a place called Versailles and the victors, primarily Great Britain and France, right, as a secondary power, the United States was there. You know, we weren't a full-fledged partner in the alliance. We were really an associated power. Okay, we always considered ourselves a full-fledged ally, you know, because that's the model that we look at ourselves in from the preeminent position we had in World War II, not so necessarily in World War I. Uh, we were kind of an add-on in the last minute for that regard. And we were really about the status, maybe a little bit more of a status than Japan, which was also an associated power, you see. But the point I'm getting at is this. Uh, and you probably have already figured it out where I'm going here, is at the end of World War I, France and England wanted, particularly France, wanted Germany to be squeezed absolutely dry. And it was punitive in nature. And it wasn't like, all right, well, it's a shame that you lost a generation of men and we lost a generation of men. Uh, and, um, you know, let's figure out what caused this and not do it again. I mean, France wanted their pound of flesh as far as Germany paying reparations to the point that it would bankrupt them. It wanted land masses and compensation for what France had felt it had lost in uh, either territory or material. Um, and it was extra extraordinarily punitive and what it did um, is created a generation of Germans living under this resentment that created the next generation that was bound on revenge for being put in that position. You know, when you add to that a certain level of circumstances like the Great Depression, the rise of Nazism, uh, you know, things like that, and it's a perfect storm, okay? But you see where I'm going here. At the end of world, at the end of the Civil War, we were in a similar situation. So you had a lot of people say, and this is the way it's always been done: the losers, there's the vanquished, and those who have vanquished. You see, the victors and the vanquished, and the vanquished don't have any say in anything, and they deserve to be crushed and exploited and everything taken from them because, after all, they lost. Right here in this country, maybe for the first time, you know, at the end of a war that was the scale of the Civil War, the federal government sought to and, be, and made the policy to bring those states back into the Union as rapidly as possible. 
and try to get back to, for want of a better word, normalcy as soon as possible. And it literally shaped world events. The, the way to get the Southern states back into the Northern states, right? So for the rest of the 19th century, this was the primary goal of the United States of America is to make ourselves whole again, right? Now you had the expansion in the West um, and the United States really didn't become a global power until the war on uh, of uh, war with Spain in 1898. And I'm just gonna bring that up for a moment to, to show you a point. In the War of 1898, the Spanish-American War, where uh, as a result of which the United States became the proud owners of Cuba, Puerto Rico, uh, the Philippine Islands, Guam, um, there were many people in positions of command of army and of navy that were formerly in the Confederate Army and the Confederate Navy. And I wonder, I want you to stop and think for a minute what it would be like to have been somebody fighting for the North, right? In the, you know, the Army of the Potomac or maybe the Union Navy. And now, you know, rather a short amount of time later have as, a, as, a, as an admiral or a general somebody who was actually fighting against you, being now in charge of your fleet, you see? And this was a common situation and it was done quite deliberately. The military, as you may have noticed, is oftentimes used to drive um, as a mechanism to, to drive certain political ends. And this was one of them after the Civil War. The United States military, the United States Armed Forces, the Navy and the Army specifically, uh, was used to try to put the country back together by letting Confederate uh, soldiers and sailors know that you are welcome back in the United States Armed Forces, you see. And um, you can imagine the level of awkwardness and tension involved in all of this and the legacy that these things have left. Um, and then of course you have carpetbaggers and you have people going down south to exploit things, right? And going back to blacks in the civil war, you know, you know that we've entered a new era where on paper at least, on paper, it's essentially illegal for slavery to exist. And you've got somebody like the post-war presidents, uh, post-Civil War presidents like Grant, it's a very interesting story, who championed the, what we call the Emancipation Amendments, the Freedom Amendments, Civil Rights Amendments. And um, that was the 13th, 14th, and the 15th Amendments to the Constitution. And these are very, very important to understand. It, technically, legally made slavery illegal. But all we did really, because the legality of it may be one thing, but you're not gonna change human nature as fast as just putting, making something law. So we have, we enter the era of Jim Crow. And for a hundred years, you have Jim Crow, which means like, well, uh, speaking to a black man or speaking to myself about a black man, you may be on paper my equal, but there ain't no way you're my equal. And I'm going to make sure that I sabotage your ability to, you know, whatever, take my job away from me or achieve something that I've achieved or this or that or the other thing. Uh, so that is Jim Crow, which, you know, moves its way all the way to the 1960s where we have our next generation of civil rights legislation, et cetera. And then you have the issues of today, okay? And um, so reconstruction is ab absolute critical period of time. You know, when I was in elementary school, and let's see, um, 
sixth grade, right? The last year of elementary school, Mrs. Brady's class. Isn't it amazing how you remember these things, right? And um, Mrs. Brady's class. And there was a new kid in the class, a new kid in the class. And this was in, I grew up in uh, Southern Westchester. I mean, as close to New York City as you can get, right? And if you would know where Glen Island is, right? Just north of City Island, there's Orchard Beach, and then there's Glen Island, right? And a place called Davenport Neck. I grew up right on the water over there. And the local school, Jefferson School, right? And we were there. And so, you know, so it's, I guess, if, if from the standpoint of North versus South, I mean, this is Yankee territory, right? And uh, so there was this poor kid. I remember feeling bad for him, even as a, as a person in sixth grade. And because he was sitting there and it was his first day and it turns out this kid had the misfortune to be in a family where his father got transferred from the deep south to where we were. And this kid was terrified. He was absolutely, he wasn't terrified because he was in a new school. He wasn't terrified because he didn't know anybody. He was terrified because he was this, he had a deep, southern accent and he was not in friendly territory right now i don't know so what i was um how old was i or what year where that was um uh, let's see sixth grade six that's 11 58 68 so that was like in the late 1960s See, so where does this legacy come from? You know, I mean, I talk to people who are, you know, my age and who I know lived in the South and they told me that their, that their school teacher in the South, their school teacher came to school and taught class in a Confederate uniform, you see? So there's still this tremendous identity with the South versus the North. And the way that the, this was all perceived Right from in the north, you the, you know the Civil War is usually called something like um, the war between the states. You see, you know, which from a northerner standpoint seems like it's relatively neutral, but from the southern point of view, it's not the war between the states. It's the war of northern aggression. You see the difference, and it's a big difference. And what I'm going to do in our class, hopefully, is I'm going to explain some of these points of view uh, as they were for the people during the time who lived it. Um, you know, and it'll give you an understanding, hopefully, of um, you know where things were at at that day. And and inherently, with all of this, with um, with the legacy that it's left. Um, now. The war, the war fought on rivers and seas is always a favorite of mine because when I was professionally, um, you know, uh, in the museum industry, I, I was uh, one of the directors of the Intrepid Sea Air Space Museum. And so, of course, naval history was my primary thing that I was interested in, uh, not because it had to be, because that's because I always enjoyed it. And um, so I'm always interested in naval warfare. And the Civil War, we usually think about as, you know, on a, on a landmass, which obviously it is, but, or was, and, but really had a tremendous influence. It was a naval revolution during the American Civil War that literally changed the, uh, the operations of navies everywhere around the world. Everyone was watching the United States to see how the Civil War was panning out and what we were coming up with and what we were doing. It was the state of the art war in all regards, you see. And um, the American North had to find a way to isolate the South. 
right? When this is standard blockade warfare, standard blockade warfare. So we have this thing called the Anaconda Plan, right? Which is, so I'll show you, a, I'll probably do a slide for you at that point. And it's just like a big snake. Then the whole thing is you're trying to squeeze the South, right? So you're gonna blockade the ports. You're gonna blockade the port of Norfolk. You're gonna blockade Savannah. You're gonna blockade Charleston. You're gonna blockade the ports in the Gulf of Mexico. You see, and what this was supposed to do was keep um, the lines of communication, if you will, between the various contacts of one Confederate force to the next to be reached via water. And you're also going to prevent the South from, from trading and communicating with outside countries. Great Britain, France, you see, and this is very, very important, you see, because just like the American Revolution, to give you a good example, remember the South, as I told you before, was fighting the David versus Goliath war, right? And so the United States during the revolution, um, as most of you at least are already aware, you know, we needed to be recognized once we had declared our independence from Great Britain, if nobody in the world was going to recognize the fledgling um, United States of America, we would probably wither and die on the vine, you see? So as it turns out, as you know, the story goes that France recognized the fledgling United States of America. And it doesn't matter why this happened, as long as it happened, you know, as it turns out, it was, you know, France had a traditional animosity and, and rivalry and um, decades and decades of warfare with Great Britain, and had been kicked out of North America, after losing what we call the French and Indian War. And it suited the French just fine to pay Great Britain back by being part of helping the American colonists, the North American, the British North American colonists defeat Great Britain. You see, so really, I mean, it was, you know, from a level of spite and from a level of, you know, how do you like them apples? Um, you know, France helped us win the Revolutionary War and that suited France just fine, just from the standpoint of principle, you see? Um, now, if the Confederate States of America could get other countries to recognize the Confederate States of America, and then the Confederate States of America can send shipfuls of cotton places, and then have silver and gold or weapons in return, then that obviously will aid the Southern cause. So it was in, from a military standpoint, uh, necessity to blockade the South. So all of these things wouldn't happen. And you wind up with a lot of famous, what we call blockade runners, or blockade runners in every blockade, okay? And um, so there are some famous uh, Confederate ships uh, that were blockade runners. And this is all the stuff of legend, because after all, anytime you can beat the unbeatable, then you are really just that damn good. And, and there were some certain instances of the Confederates uh, case in doing that. Uh, like you have one ship called the CSS, which stands for Confederate State Ship Alabama. And that was a famous ship. And um, you know, I'll talk about that. And I'm also going to talk about riverine warfare. Now, we didn't have a riverine war after the Civil War, riverine meaning on the river, which you probably already figured out, right? And the next big riverine war that the United States fought of equal importance of rivers was, guess what, Vietnam. 
Uh, but in the Civil War, the rivers were critical. If you consider a map of, you know, our areas of responsibility or AORs or area of, of, of operation, uh, I mean, even around the Chesapeake Bay area, okay, you know, the, the, the York River, the, uh, the James River, the Elizabeth River, uh, all the rest of that. Um, and now down south, I mean, what about the Mississippi River? And, you know, so you're able to bring, uh, like I said, communications, supplies, troops back and forth to fortify positions and whoever controls these waterways uh, to a large extent controls the landmass. Okay, because that means that now your enemy is forced to travel in what are going to be rather predictable um, um trails across any given landmass right so the um the southerners were forced to convert anything that they can convert into suitable warships uh and they were suffering from the disadvantage of not having this industrial base you see so where the united states the north that is the Union forces were knocking out ships and steam engines and machinery and ironclads uh, because we literally had all of this equipment all over the place. The South had to be very, very careful about its resources because it had a very, very limited ability to build a steam engine, you see? Uh, and that is a big part of our story uh, as far as the river warfare is concerned. Um, you know, famous things that occurred, you know, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. You know, that was, what was it, Farragut. Um, and so you have those stories. I'm going to tell you the story about the Monitor versus the Merrimack, right, which is probably the best known story. And it's a great story, by the way. And it's an absolutely great story uh, as far as illuminating the things we're talking about. And uh, another great story is the, is the one about the Alabama and how is they were driving the this raider, the CSS Alabama was had to be chased down and eventually, you know, apprehended and taken into battle by Union forces, you know, but it was a tremendous point of pride to have a one ship in of that David force give a black eye to everybody else in the Goliath force, you see. Uh, and this is part of human nature, which makes it part of the people who fought the Civil War, which makes it part of the Civil War. Remember, we're talking about things like this in the fashion of through people and through society, because it is people and society that fights these things for the reasons that people in society fight these things. It's not just about machines. It's not just about maps or charts. It's about personalities. It's about, it's about traditions. It's about culture. Um, that's what these things are fought over. And um, well, there's a good overview, I think. Um, that's my introduction for you. We've got... Um, approximately 10 minutes left. If you've got some uh, something that you would like to have an answer to, or you want me to cover, chances are I'll probably cover it anyway, but go ahead and ask me. Or if you've got any questions right up front right now, I'll go ahead and I'll see if I can answer it for you. So let's look in the chat room and see what we've got. And That's if anybody can- um, hmm? So far in the chat, but if anybody has a question that they wanna pop into that, you can also do the raise hand feature. If you have a question and you don't wanna be on camera, if you put it in chat, then I'll just read it out loud. Our next session is in two weeks, November 17th, Abraham Lincoln and the election of 1860. Again, if you were registered for this program and you received the Zoom invitation, you're going to keep receiving those. So if you want to skip a class or you can't make it to one, don't cancel your registration. You can just um, not show up for that class and you'll continue getting them. We do have a question from Susan. You mentioned the Spanish-American War. What was the cause of that? And do we have an ally? 
the Spanish-American War, 1898. Now, we have this thing called the Monroe Doctrine from 1820. And the Monroe Doctrine is a statement by the fledgling United States of America, right? That by the year 1820, we had felt enough sense of um, responsibility and ownership, appropriate or not, of wanting to control what went on in the entire Western Hemisphere from the United States of America, see? Even as a new country. And uh, because there was still this feeling from the original revolution, the Revolutionary War, that we were on a new continent where good things were gonna happen. And Europe was still a place, the old world, if you will, Mediterranean basin, Europe, where people have been fighting essentially forever. And the French are always gonna hate the English and the Dutch are there and the Portuguese are there and the Spanish are there. And a lot of damage has been done around the world from, you know, ages of exploration, et cetera. And the United States was going to be the new shiny example of the way that things ought to be done. So it was a shot across the bow, so to speak, the Monroe Doctrine, for European countries to mind their own business and stay in Europe. And anything that happened in South America or North America if especially if it involved political power or military power, you were gonna have to come and you were gonna have to deal with the United States. That's a pretty heavy, heady thing, you see. And this clearly included a water body of water called the Caribbean, you see? And um, the Caribbean, the Caribbean is our, it's like that the Caribbean for us in the United States would be like, me going out into my front yard. You see what I mean? And this is my front yard. And move your damn car because your car doesn't belong on my blank, blank lawn. You see what I mean? That's what the Caribbean is. Now, Cuba is got quite a few American companies in it you know, sugar companies. Uh, remember this tremendous business down in the Caribbean, uh, mostly at the hands of the British, by the way. If you think about places like Barbados and you think about places like Jamaica and, um, you know, the West Indies. And, and, but we had sugar plantations and products of sugar like um, rum, right? This is huge commodities. And the world's addicted to sugar, if you didn't already know that, all right? And this is a pretty big deal. So the United States has interests in Cuba because we have American business in Cuba. And it's the, good prob it's the, pro it's the purview of the American government to protect Americans uh, who are, happen to be overseas, and in this case, right under our nose, you see, in the Caribbean. Right, I remind you that Cuba is what 89 miles from Key West at the nearest point. Okay, so if we're not going to watch out for Americans 89 miles from our own damn shores, so what happens is that the, the Spanish are still from the ancient days of the age of exploration, all right, which wasn't really ancient, it was only really a couple of hundred years. And they are still in control of Cuba and Spanish, and they're doing a lousy job of it. Spain, Spain's got its own problems, and essentially it's just not paying attention to Cuba, although it still wants to be sovereign to Cuba, you see? Now, the Cubans, proud, capable people, are saying like, you know, hey, Spain, you better address some of the issues going on here on this damn island, or we're, you're going to have a problem. We're going to have a rebellion. You see, 
And there was a lot of rabble rousing going on and rightfully so from at least my point of view. And Spain, they wanted to send some forces there to quell the problem, you see, which they did kind of clumsily. And there's a lot of tension in Cuba. Right, Spain really doesn't have the resources. It's just like another country trying to maintain a colony after the after the expiration date, you know. And, and and Spain did a lousy job, and the Cubans were angry. And there was the 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 companies that were in Spain, sugar companies, etc. Requested from the federal government that we go down to see if we could do something to protect them, American interests, in case war actually broke out. So we sent this ship down there, which was at the time a new ship, right? And this is a brand new era now. We're moving away from the warships that look like the old sailing ships. And we have a new generation of ships that are designed as steam ships, right? And they have a whole different look to them. And, um, you know, big guns and it's a battleship. The battleship is called the USS Maine, like the state of Maine. And the Spanish through diplomatic channels invite us to Havana Harbor to have a presence there, you see? Right, because after all the, Spa the Spanish are still in charge. So we, now all of these ships all run on coal. Right, they got tons and tons and tons and tons of coal in coal bunkers, right? And um, and you know these big steam engines and all the rest of this stuff, and they're warships with big guns, so they have all of these ammunition storage places called magazines, right? Where all of this ammunition is stacked up, and it's separated by these wrought iron bulkheads. And the USS Maine steams on down there and pulls up in Havana Harbor. And um, this is called gunboat diplomacy, by the way. And it's moored to this mooring in Havana Harbor that the Spanish assigned to us, which is normal. And uh, that is that presence there is supposed to be a stabilizing See, like the way our troops are in, in uh, I don't know, Germany right now, you see. And um, the main explodes in this enormous explosion, rips the ship in two pieces, and both pieces sink promptly to the bottom with heavy loss of life. 1898. Now we have newspapers, especially New York newspapers, that are in the business of, well, what would we call it today? We would call it either fake news or we would call it misinformation, in case you think these are new phenomena. Okay. So these papers go into overdrive. And they create a story. And the story is that the Spanish deliberately invited the USS Maine, the United States government and the USS Maine to moor at this particular mooring spot because the Spanish had planted a gigantic bomb where the Maine was going to be hovering over. So the Spanish blew our ship to pieces and all of the people got blown to pieces with it. And this paper, right, you had the Hearst newspapers, you had the uh, Joseph Pulitzer's newspapers just push this, what today we would call a narrative, you see? And it just sent out these uh, publication after publication after publication about how the Spain stabbed us in the back and we went down there in good faith and the Spanish actually led us into this ambush and blew our guys up. And the United States declared war on Spain because of this. And we went down to the Caribbean. 
And we went out to, we had another squadron called the Asiatic Squadron, we went out to the Philippines, right? So you had the Battle of Manila Bay and you had the Battle of Santiago where we actually beat the Spanish fleet in both places. And that's how we wound up with the Philippine Islands. And we had a presence in the middle of the Pacific at that point because of it. It became a protectorate of ours, which we gave back in 1946. And of course we gave after Cuba was won, we actually gave it back to the Cubans, but we kept Puerto Rico and Guam. And it changed the course of history. The United States was now on the map as a world power. The Spanish had been kicked out of their holdings, you see? Um, and it changed the course of history as far as our influence in this region, et cetera, et cetera. And you, know, you can see the ramifications of some of the other parts of this story. I mean, the whole thing was for I mean, it was the Spanish never did it. Uh, the, um, the, the main in Havana Harbor was salvaged. We went down there with professional people, even in, during that day. And we, like by 1913 or so, we had completely excavated both halves of the main and thorough photographs were taken of the damage and the wreckage and everything else like that. And then the rear half of the ship, which was really two thirds of the ship, was still relatively intact. So they refloated it and brought it out into the Atlantic Ocean, uh, or I guess maybe it was the Caribbean. And they opened the sea valves and they gave it a, a warrior's farewell um, with the American flag flying. You see, but in the 1970s, a famous um, American uh, naval person who was in charge of naval reactors, by the way, uh, named Admiral Rickover, who is an excellent engineer, um, did a, an entire post facto forensic study on all of the photographs of the main uh, that were taken when they excavated it. And with scientific um, analysis, it was undisputably determined that the main did not explode as the result of an external ex uh, ex um, explosion, as in a mine. It exploded because there had been a low simmering coal fire in one of the coal bunkers that heated up the bulkhead in between the coal bunker and the neighboring bulkhead on the other side of it was the magazine for the ammunition for the secondary battery, which was a six inch guns, right? And so in other words, the bulkhead heated up from the coal fire, heated up the ammunition and the ammunition exploded and blew the bottom out of the main, you see? And that was conclusively determined by Admiral Rickover. And uh, so in other words, we started this whole war based on what this BS from these newspapers put out and it enraged the American public that we went down there to kick their butts. Now, I think there may be actually a moral in this story. Um, but anyway, it's interesting history, isn't it? All right. Um, I'll see you all next week. Yep. Thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely, and thank you so much. If anybody is interested in learning more about the Spanish-American War and American imperialism, Howie has a book suggestion called True Flag. That might be something, um, I don't know if we have it here at the library, but if you're interested in that, contact me and I'll see if we can get it. As always, if you have questions that you don't feel comfortable asking in the group or you think of something in the middle of the night, always shoot me an email. I get those questions to Arthur and he could either email you back or we'll address it at the next class. So thank you everybody for being here with us today and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you, Arthur.